lab-grown meat is coming, with at least three companies releasing products to the market in the near future. Lab-grown meat does not need to be genetically modified. This may be the start of a new age, a second domestication of animals, where just the muscle cells are grown without harming the animal, wasting animal parts, and greatly reducing the impact of the meat industry on the environment. The meat industry is responsible for around 15% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Growing livestock uses around 25% of available land and very large parts of freshwater reserves. Meat is easily contaminated and human and animal interactions can cause the jumping of diseases like avian flu. And the meat industry causes vast amounts of animal suffering, with the livestock stuffed into tiny spaces. In addition, the meat industry is the biggest consumer of antibiotics, leading us to antibiotic resistance and an era of superbacteria. But we're nowhere near getting lab-grown meat cheap and widely available. This is the very beginning. Let's see how lab-grown meat is made, and what the challenges facing industrial-scale production are. Let's take a look at the basic process for culturing meat. A sample of meat is taken from an anesthetized animal. Adult muscle stem cells, also known as satellite cells, are separated from the sample. These cells are then grown in an environment that resembles the animal body as close as possible, with oxygen and appropriate nutrients present in the growth medium, that is the liquid surrounding the cells. The growing of these cells can be divided into two phases. First, the stem cells are replicated to grow their number, and then the replicated cells are ushered to develop into muscle cells. This is how Mark Post's research group from the University of Maastricht made the world's first cultured hamburger, costing around 250,000 euros or $325,000. The price was this high because the burger was made of around 20,000 tiny strips of meat, separately hand-grown and then combined. We can't grow blood vessels to the cultured muscle cells to supply them with oxygen and nutrients, and that's why the cells could only be grown in very thin layers. For muscle cells to grow, they need a framework to attach to. One method that's looking promising for growing muscle cells in an industrial scale is to use small beads as the framework for the cells to grow on. The beads can be made of starch, that is carbohydrates, or collagen, the protein in between cells and tissues, or other similar materials. These beads can float in the growth medium, and thus muscle cells are not limited to growing on a flat surface. Beads are small enough for oxygen and nutrients to be able to reach all cells growing in the bead. Another obstacle to growing meat artificially is the fact that animal serum, that is blood with the blood cells and blood clotting proteins removed, has been traditionally used as part of the growth medium. It provides the cells different factors they need for growth, but it's expensive and not something you'd want to use on an industrial scale. The companies rolling out lab-grown meats have researched animal-free growth mediums intensely, and companies like Memphis Meats and Just Inc both claim that they have come up with alternative solutions. To make things trickier, cells from different species need their own animal-free growth medium recipes. The cow satellite muscle cells seem especially picky and have been difficult to grow without an animal-based growth medium. According to Just Inc., the first product hitting the markets in 2018 is going to be something avian. The starting stem cell line is also something that is crucial to get right. The satellite adult stem cells can only make more of themselves or turn into muscle cells. They can't make bone or fat cells, etc., and they can only divide around 20 times. Another cell type that has also been studied for the starting material of muscle cells are pluripotent stem cells. Pluripotent means capable of many things. The pluripotent stem cells have the capability to become many more cell types than just muscle cells. In fact, they can make all the cells in the body, and they can divide unlimitedly, unlike the satellite cells. Since the satellite cells can only divide around 20 times, new cells have to be harvested from animals once in a while. 
In contrast, a pluripotent stem cell line is like sourdough yeast. Once you have it going, you have it forever. The only problem is that we don't have a pluripotent stem cell line from a cow. Taking embryonic stem cells from a cow is possible, but it's proven difficult to keep the cells going on in the lab. Induced pluripotent stem cells are also an option. Here a specific set of genes is artificially activated in a cell, like a cat cell, and this turns the cell into a pluripotent stem cell. It's really a fascinating topic and absolutely deserves a video of its own. Induced pluripotent pig cells have been used to produce muscle cells, and this has been done without animal serum. Another alternative would be to immortalize the satellite cells, making them capable of infinite cell divisions. An effective way to immortalize a cell is to turn on the gene producing the telomere repairing telomerase enzyme. Telomeres are repeating DNA at the end of chromosomes that shorten as the cell divides. The more the cell divides, the shorter the telomeres get. When the telomeres are short enough, the cell can't divide anymore. Activating the telomerase enzyme in the cell fixes the shortened telomeres, giving the cell infinite life. But this requires genetic engineering and marketing the meat product gets more difficult. Even when the cells can effectively be supplied with nutrients and oxygen, the growth medium is perfected and cell lines are optimized for muscle cell production, the end product is not going to be anything close to a steak. It's going to be a mass of cells resembling minced meat. A lot of research is directed towards perfecting the taste by growing fat cells with the muscle cells and finding ways to stimulate the cells to produce lots of protein. But the taste of meat is determined by around a thousand different chemicals, and part of the taste comes from what happens to the meat when butchered. It forms lactic acid, its pH drops, and the tissue-breaking proteins start working. Getting lab-grown meat to resemble a steak is still far off, but this technology is taking its very first steps. With time, it may drastically change the way we consume meat, assuming that the public is willing to embrace a technological solution to one of the great problems of modern society. Although growing meat in a lab can be quite energy intensive, at least in the beginning, the huge potential for lowering freshwater and land use, limiting methane emissions from cows, animal welfare and safety are goals to strive for. Thanks for watching. If you're liking the content and want to help this small channel grow, subscribe, leave a like, and tell us in the comments if lab-grown meat could be part of your diet in the future. There's links to research articles and magazine stories in the description for further reading to those who are interested. See you again in the next video.